Hi everyone. My name is Carissa Little and I am one of the account development managers here at USDTO. Thank you all for joining us today for another installment of Tax Time. And if you are new to Tax Time, we welcome you. Today's event is about an overview of a research poster on Kratom. Presenting today's scientific poster, we have Amy Racines, who is the Research and Development Projects Coordinator here at USDTO. She will provide a brief overview presentation on a scientific poster titled, Using Umbilical Cord Tissue to Determine Prenatal Exposure to Kratom. Amy holds a master's degree in forensic science from the University of Florida and has been with USDTL for over a decade. Amy has papers published in scientific journals and related to umbilical cord research and mass spectrometry and is a member of many forensic and science related organizations, including the position of previous presidency of Midwest Association of Toxicology and the Therapeutic Drug Monitoring and Chicago Chromatography Group. With her extensive background and her current role here at USDTL, she can present this poster that you all will find very informative. All right, so let's get started with this great poster presentation. Enjoy, everyone. Thank you so much, Carissa, for that introduction. And thank you all so much for being here today. So as she mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about a poster which describes the method that we use to detect kratom and umbilical cord. We tend to develop assays in umbilical cord before meconium simply because our clients prefer umbilical cord testing. One advantage of umbilical cord testing is that it is immediately available upon birth. At times, it can take babies multiple days to pass meconium, especially if that baby is premature. This can mean a delayed drug testing result, and that can be valuable time lost, especially if that baby is experiencing withdrawal symptoms. A second advantage of umbilical cord testing is that there is usually plenty of sample volume available, and so we don't experience the same quantity not sufficient for testing problems that we do with meconium. And lastly, our clients have expressed that the collection is much easier for umbilical cord as nurses don't have to scrape diapers for the meconium sample and risk contamination of that specimen. A number of sources have stated that there is great congruency in meconium and umbilical cord drug testing results. Kratom is an herbal extract that comes from the leaves of an evergreen tree that is native to Southeast Asia. The leaves of that plant can be chewed, ingested, or brewed in tea, or the kratom can be extracted from the plant and put into pill form for various uses. At low doses, kratom acts as a stimulant, but at high doses, it acts as a sedative and it does have effects similar to those experienced by opioid users. Kratom is legal at the federal level. We decided to develop this assay based on the value that we believe that this assay can give our clients. There have been multiple studies in the literature which have stated that babies exposed to kratom in utero can experience neonatal abstinence syndrome, even in the absence of any other drug of abuse, including opioids. Based off of this information, we thought this assay could be a valuable tool for our clients to help them be a voice for the voiceless. And honestly, this is really the reasoning behind all of the assays that we develop. This assay detects metragenine and 7-hydroxymetragenine, which are two of the psychoactive alkaloids found in the kratom plant. At the time that we were pioneering this prenatal kratom detection, these were the only two analytes of interest in the field. Since then, there have been other alkaloids that have become of interest, but it appears from the current data that metragenine has always been present even when these other alkaloids are detected. And most often, metragenine has the highest concentration of all the alkaloids detected for each specimen. We developed two different methods for these analytes. One method is used for screening and the second method is used for confirmation. Any sample that is reported out as positive must be analyzed by both methods. Two separate aliquots are used for the two methods, and the two methodologies are completely different, which means that we use different instrumentation to detect our analytes of interest. Our screening assay uses an instrument called the LDTDMSMS, 
and that stands for Laser Diode Thermal Desorption Tandem Mass Spectrometer. The confirmation assay uses LC-MS-MS, and that stands for Liquid Chromatography Tandem Mass Spectrometer. Additionally, the results of both tests are compared to each other to ensure congruency. If the results of the two methods are not consistent, that specimen will be reanalyzed before it is reported out. This two-tiered testing process ensures that our results are accurate and reliable. This process is the cornerstone of forensically defensible results. The results section of this poster depicts the results of the validation that was completed. Our validation criteria are dictated by our accrediting agencies, and we follow the most recent standards that were released by the American Standards Board in 2017. This validation ensures that our method is accurate and robust and that our results are reliable. Throughout the validation process, we analyze over 300 controls and specimens, and all of this data is entered into spreadsheets. We then perform statistical calculations on that data to verify that all of our criteria either meet or exceeds the requirements. This validation typically takes about two months, but this does not include the time that it takes to develop the assay, which must be completed prior to initiation of the validation. This development can take anywhere from two months to six or more months, and that really just depends on the complexity of the analytes that we are trying to detect. So unfortunately, there can be quite a delay between when we decide to develop an assay as to when we can actually offer that assay to our clients. The table shown here includes a selection of the assay performance characteristics, which were statistically calculated from the validation data. These characteristics are statistics which basically tell us how well our assay works. So just to mention a few of these parameters, we analyze the precision at multiple concentrations throughout our curve, and the coefficient of variation, also known as CV, must be less than 20% at each concentration for our assay to be considered acceptable. We also analyze commonly interfering substances, such as aspirin or acetaminophen, and we do that just to verify that these compounds do not negatively impact our assay. We also analyze the stability of our prepared extracts to verify that our method is robust and also so that we are aware of any limitations that our assay may have. Other characteristics include the cutoff, the linear range, the limit of detection, and the matrix effect. So I'm not gonna go into any more detail on those characteristics right now, but if you do have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them at the end of this presentation. Figure two on this poster is a histogram which depicts the concentration of all specimens that we reported as containing metragenine. This data set includes all specimens that we have reported out from the time that we launched the assay in March of 2021 through December of 2022. Along the x-axis are the concentration ranges observed, and along the y-axis are the number of specimens containing that range of concentrations. We periodically review this type of data to verify that our cutoff is still appropriate. Figure one shows the polysubstance use that we observed in all specimens that we reported out as containing either metragenine or 7-hydroxymetragenine. Once again, this data set includes all specimens we reported out from the time that we launched the assay in March of 2021 through December of 2022. Not surprisingly, the most commonly used drugs we found along with Kratom were THC, gabapentin, and opioids. THC typically has our highest positivity rate, so it's not surprising that individuals who are using Kratom would also be using THC. Kratom does have a lot of opioid-like properties, so once again, it's not surprising that an individual using Kratom would also be using gabapentin or opioids. Which was surprising, however, was this dark green slice of the pie. That area represents the specimens that we reported out as containing either metragenine or 7-hydroxymetragenine, but those specimens were reported as negative for all other drugs that they were analyzed for. That was equivalent to 62% of the specimens that contained metragenine or 7-hydroxymetragenine. 
This is crucial to note because as I mentioned in the introduction, it has been reported that kratom exposure in utero can cause neonatal abstinence syndrome, even in the absence of all other drugs. So if a newborn is experiencing withdrawal symptoms and that specimen did test negative for all other opioids, it very well could be kratom. In conclusion, this poster describes our fully validated methods for the detection of metragenine and 7-hydroxymetragenine in umbilical cord. Due to the results of our polysubstance use, which indicates that over half of all newborns exposed to kratom are not exposed to any other drugs, we believe this assay aligns with our vision of protecting and enriching lives. We hope our clients find this assay useful. So thank you so much for listening. And at this time, I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Subscribe to our channel to see more videos like this.